Double P Podcast is proud to present Z, the first podcast you listen to after you watch Why the Last Man. My name's Bubba, and with me, as always, is someone who is as vanilla as they come. It's Catfish. Oh, Bubba, I'm so glad to join you. Hey, yeah. have you heard this one? What? A tuna fish sandwich walks into a bar. The bartender says, I'm not serving a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> and the t- no, no, that's it. It's just a setup, God damn it. No, the bartender says, I can't, uh, I don't serve tuna fish sandwich. The tuna fish sandwich says, why not? The bartender says, we only serve good food. Oh, God damn it. How you like them apples, huh? You know, somebody told yeah. me this one. That here's a good anti-joke. Okay. So, a horse walks into a bar. Yeah. And then everyone leaves realizing the inherent danger in the situation. <laughs> Catfish, we are here yeah. to tell jokes to crack wise about episode five of season one of Why the Last Man, Manhunt. Yorick and Agent 355 search for Dr. Allison Mann in war-torn Boston. Back mm-hmm. in D.C., Jennifer hides the truth about Yorick from her political rivals. What is your rating out of 10 for this fifth episode? Well, Bubba, I'm going to give this what I like to call 9.355s. I couldn't decide, so once again, it's so good it gets two doubles. Double what? P's. Oh, wait, double P's? Yeah, post-it put-downs. <laughs> Ouch. And then uh, double H's. Wait, oh, double double H? Yeah, hummus haters. Oh, man. Oh, man, that is stone cold hate. I think the only thing I brought it down is uh, it's just a personal thing. It's not their fault. It's my fault. I'm still experiencing trauma over all the political machinations. I love everything that's happening out in the field. I'm a little... Just maybe a little bit down besides that on, I would like them to clear up some of the stuff that's going on with 355 before we add a whole bunch more. But I love where they're going with this. They picked up the third member of their party, Dr. Allison Mann. She is a wise cracker. Oh, yeah. And she's a York puncher. And so, and so I'm loving her. We're on the road now. We're, uh, are you going to San Francisco? That's it for me, Bubba. What, now, what about you? What did you give it? I didn't go as high as you did. I only am going to give this eight triple Fs out of 10. Whoa, well, well, wait a second. When it's triple Fs, that's almost like eight cubed. Triple Fs? Right. Fran's foster care forces. <laughs> Fran has been uh, searching the foster care for some forces, and mm-hmm. they seem none too happy. They want to pretty much want to say F you, maybe that's a quadruple F, to Fran about what they did. Why am I 8 out of 10, where last week I dipped down a bit? For me, Why? before we watch this show, I typed in the show mm-hmm. notes, we're 70 odd days from a day when all the men died. Certainly many pregnant women must have given birth to baby boys, right? What's happened to them? I typed that out in the show notes because I wanted to talk about it in today's Mm -hmm. episode. And the show is thinking the same questions I as a viewer am having. That's brilliant. I love it. Eight out of ten. Hell yeah. I cannot go quite as high as you went, Catfish. Mm -hmm. There's this weird push and pull, Catfish, where I'm going to compare the show to the show that started our podcast career, Game of Thrones. Game Mm -hmm. of Thrones, in the first season... The very first episode ended with a big shock. Why the last man ends with a big shock, all those men dying. Then Game of Thrones really has to spit out a lot of exposition to get us to get this story cooking. It has to explain, okay, this is this person's relation to this. This is going to build all this stuff. And many people said it was that end of episode four. Okay, we got to all this stuff. We can really cook with gas. I always tell people, if you're going to watch Game of Thrones and you had no interest, you got to make it through those first four episodes before the show will take off and you'll fall in love with it. We've reached the halfway point, and there still feels to me like we're not quite ready to kick it into high gear like I wish we would. That is a weird saying when I've already mentioned it felt like maybe there should be a second episode where we really get to see the world in the days immediately after the traumatic event that killed all these Y-chromosome creatures. But I liked it. The whole time through, I liked it. And even the end, I was like, okay, that's a good ending. But it doesn't feel like we're ready to kick in high gear. We are at the halfway point, and I'm just expecting more. What about you? We're halfway through. How do you feel about Why the Last Man through the first half of season one? I see, I see your point, and I would like to know more about, still would like to know more about the broader world. Mm-hmm. We get hints, but I, I feel like we could add a lot more danger to it if we had a little bit more 
than hints. But I do th I do like the way they drop they drop these things in here. I mean, we just kind of cursorily, um, you know, three fifty five get some information about stuff that's going on. I mean, we sort of get tangential hints, which is oh, yeah. which is interesting for sure. But yeah, maybe a, a, a broadening it out might help a little bit to help that sense of forward momentum to get the sense of like the tea kettle boiling heavily. Oh yeah, exactly right. Listeners, we always love to say, who cares what we think? We want to know what you think. Reach out to us on social media and tell us what you think. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at double PHQ. That's the word double, the single letter P for podcast, HQ for headquarters at double PHQ on Twitter and Instagram, facebook.com slash double PHQ. If you're watching this on YouTube, give us those comments below. We want to hear from you. Remember, Bubba, yeah. you can't unsubscribe in anger if you haven't already initially subscribed. That's right. Hit that subscribe button. I know Apple Podcasts wants to make it seem like subscribe is a way to pay while you follow just to follow. We don't want your money. Just subscribe, follow, give us that thumbs up, anything that you can so you can join us on this journey into the world without Y chromosome. Catfish, we did get some feedback this week. You ready to dive in? Oh, hell yeah. Our first feedback is from a longtime listener. Oh, I don't yeah. want to say old listener because... No. All of our listeners are young at heart. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to deal with our bullshit. Um, <laughs> it's Court at Gendeve, J-E-N-N-D-E-V-E. -E -E. And Court says, catching up on my podcast. You guys are killing it. Never change. Huh. Totally agree with you all on Hero and Why. Thank you. They're messy as hell. Also, love Agent 355. Such a badass. Hope we get the more nuance of her character. Would hate to see them make her one note oh man this is why we love feedback this is why we love double l loyal listeners like court at jen deve that's j-e-n-n-d-e-v-e -E -E, a great follow on twitter because she thinks about things that maybe catfish you and i weren't thinking about there's been through five episodes maybe i'm fine with her being a one note badass because she's so great at it but this is a good point from Court, and so I like it. What do well, you think? Well, I think Court hasn't listened to the last episode where I described in detail and correctly the five different tools oh, no. that Agent 355 has. Four tools plus one. Right. Uh, yeah. that she, is... If she heard that podcast, she would unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> they feel like they fleshed out a little bit and more in this episode. I feel like we're, to me, she is like... Even though it's Why the Last Man, I feel like she is the lead character. The central uh, protagonist. We get, yeah, we get some lightning of her. Um, she's the one who has the most mystery behind her. We did get some lightning of Yorick. We're getting more lightning of Yorick. Um, and also, the more we're seeing President Brown, the more we understand why her children are horrible. <laughs> so, uh, I think we are getting some fleshing out of people. Listeners, what do you think about Court's feedback at Double PHQ? Let us know. Catfish, we got some other feedback. The showrunner of Why the Last Man, writer-producer Eliza Clark, sent us a tweet. And what'd she say? She said, as always, you guys are very funny, and I love the music analysis at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. I can't believe we figured out so early that the event was a result of nefarious rabbits. Oh, man. Hashtag confirmed. We want to thank Eliza Clark's personal assistant, who manages her Twitter account, for reaching out to us with this <laughs> feedback on Twitter. Because, let's be honest, there is uh -huh. no way an important showrunner like Eliza Clark would waste her time listening to a bunch of clowns like us. She's got to be breaking down the story for season two, right? This should be FX on Hulu's marketing department reaching out to us, giving us some goodies, giving us these screeners so we can get these podcasts out sooner. Go on, Hulu, let's go. Thank you, assistant. Tell Eliza Clark we are very appreciative of her feedback. You know, the only thing I can think of, Bubba, is you yeah. know sometimes when you're uh, on the treadmill or you're exercising right. and you need something to spur you on, to make you angry or frustrated to keep you going? It's possible that the real at the Eliza Clark is listening to us while exercising, maybe hitting a heavy bag. Maybe she's already got pictures of us on the heavy bag. It's possible that it's the real at the Eliza Clark. Impossible. Listeners, okay. if you <laughs> <laughs> listeners, if you want to join in on the silliness and the musical analysis, we're gonna have another great segment from our friend Matt Murdick on the music later on in this podcast. Please once again reach out to us at double PHQ. 
Hey, Bubba, since we've got an awesome connection to the show, yeah. uh, the personal assistant, mm-hmm. I wonder if we should beg them for some swag to give away. We're always giving away no, swag man. at we the are. end of our seasons, and usually we end up buying it ourselves. <laughs> right. Please. Anything. Once again, I'm going to reach out to the FX on Hulu marketing department. Now, uh, if you listen to this around the world, this could be on Disney Plus. It could be on Disney Plus add-on star. It could be on Disney add-on star plus. It could be on something called Hot Star. However you listen to this, here in America, we get it on Hulu in a folder called FX on Hulu. So yeah, marketing department, send us something that we want to send to our loyal listeners who've been giving us this great feedback. Listeners, if you want to be eligible to win a prize, whether it's one from the official marketing department or from Catfish or I, please just share the podcast, uh, share the tweets, share the Facebook post, share the YouTube video, and help us spread the word about the celebration we do of this great TV show. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, speaking of this great TV show, yeah, Bubba, let's stop flapping our gums and All then right. flap our gums some more talking oh. about the show. Okay, here comes some gum flapping. It seems like these episodes tend to have just two focuses. We have a focus on Team York, Agent 355, which seems to add another team member this week. Or do you want to focus on all the craziness down in Washington, D.C.? Oh, once again, since it, since it since it, it it's it's hurting my psyche, maybe we do Washington D.C. first and save uh, my favorite character now favorite characters Ooh. until the end. Certainly, I had no idea that you loved those National Guard's women who guard this Harvard <laughs> campus so much. All right, yeah, let's go down to D.C. D.C. What a fun fun city! I've spent many a New Year's Eve in. Is it the Cat Club there in D.C.? Great city. My new favorite character, Secretary Regina Oliver, has made it back. <laughs> Congratulations. She's the real president. She's POTUS, um, man. And so, of course, because of all that, President Brown has decided, I will serve you faithfully under the rules of uh, the United States Constitution. Let's talk more about how uh, <laughs> re- President, let's talk about President Regina Oliver. Wait, is that not what happened, Bubba? Well, not <laughs> quite. Holy cow. President Oliver has left Israel, and she's ready to run this town, man. She is ready. While we're waiting on Regina Oliver to show up, President Brown finds out, hey, there was some tracking software in the helicopters. We should be able to find them. And President Brown knows who took those helicopters. And so she pushes to make it be a small team. Because, wait, no, no, don't have too many people look for those helicopters. We need to save precious resources. Later on, guess what? They find the choppers. They're both down. What do you think President Brown's plan is here, Catfish? I mean, I would hope that her plan is to uh, appear as if she's upset about this, but that not that she's going to whisper things to people in front of other people, including uh, Megan McCain. Psst, Catfish, don't let Eliza Clark know that we're doing this podcast. <laughs> okay, I won't. And that I'll we're going to track that helicopter. Oh, boy. What do, you, uh, what do you think here? What do you think about the president? I mean, she's not doing uh, a great job, I think. <laughs> is, it, is it truly usurping or is it me usurping? <laughs> she's, not, she's not letting you in charge. She's in charge. This is very tricky, and I assume it's going to come to a head in the next episode, but I'm not sure why it didn't come to a head in this episode as soon as the woman shows up the same chain of succession that led president brown to become president brown means that regina oliver is the president so i don't understand what the pussyfooting around is i mean let's be let's what, be honest what, here what my it, politics align with president brown and not with regina oliver mm-hmm. but dems the rules right the same reason why we're not going to let uh, Megan McCain or Megan McCain's mother take over. Right. Regina Oliver should be the one who's the president. What if, though, Catfish, what yeah, if tell me. in mm-hmm. this universe, mm-hmm. Rudy Giuliani's rules became law? <laughs> Again, you're giving me agita. But, <laughs> you know, once you start arguing mm-hmm. that the rules shouldn't be followed, as we've seen, it's a slippery slope, Bubba, a real slippery slope. And everybody loves a slip and slide. What's the problem? <laughs> now, Except for NBC, which cannot show their slip and slide program. 
No. They taped nine episodes of Vault with Slip and Slide, and then 90 members of the crew got shorty. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. What's the way to bring so, this down. Yeah, yeah sure. Because what's not bringing me down is the politics of this show. You aren't happy for Kimberly? Kimberly got a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. She's in the room where it happens. She is in the room where, it's, where it happens, but that's not enough for her. What? She wants to just start, she just wants to go start blackmailing Christine. There were a lot of great lines in this episode. Well, I think this might have been my third favorite line when Christine says, can you blackmail me some other time? When is a good time to be blackmailed? I mean, not when you are spotting. <laughs> <laughs> in the bathroom. That's a bad time to be blackmailed. Uh, did you like the moment where Kimberly's purse falls over? I believe we saw her steal maybe some crayons or something in a previous episode. And here we see that she's taken, we assume she's taken, a lot of these kid things. It's almost like her way of staying connected to her lost boys. I mean, I'd feel sorry for her. Mm -hmm. You but would. But she's a horrible, no. she's a horrible person. <laughs> Catfish, how many yes. characters on this show have you mentioned have been horrible? So <laughs> we're adding the list. We're keeping the list. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, uh, the show itself has told me that Regina Oliver is horrible. What? But at least so far. She's a she's survivor. A, she's, and, but, and not also a usurper. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> well, she can't, technically she could not be a usurper because technically she should be the president. As much as I wouldn't want her to be the president, again, I think what we've learned recently is once you start ignoring the rules, then it's anarchy. Okay, let's focus on the subject mm -hmm. of the forthcoming blackmail. Christine is pregnant, and she mm -mm. thinks she's going to have a miscarriage. We assume, the show didn't spell it out 100%, maybe, I'm, maybe we, it's nice that it doesn't have to spell it out 100%. She's worried she's going to have a miscarriage because she's worried she's carrying a boy. And right. then uh, it said Christine is probably having a girl. Uh, you know, raising a child by yourself in a post-apocalyptic world is not fun. How do you think Christine's feeling right now? She's got to be freaked out. I mean, first of all, okay, yeah. I mean, in the world of this show, we lost men. Mm -hmm. uh, but later on in the show, Christine doesn't maybe know this, but Dr. Mann clues us in that it's not just men who died. Right. Even though Christine doesn't know that, I mean you pretty much can't assume anything at this point. So mm. even if she's having a girl, who knows? That's exactly right. And she has to deal with this on her own. You know, she has this big stress in her life. And yet with this big stress, she can't bring this up to the president. She has to support the president who is going through her own stress because President Brown is freaking out. There are two downed helicopters. She mm -hmm. knows her son was in one of those helicopters. Ooh, Plus, there's the thought that, wait a minute, did Agent 355 do this because she thought I wanted her to do this? Are these deaths on my hands? I mean, President Brown getting real stressed, and Christine, who kind of has stuff to deal with herself, she isn't allowed to deal with her own things. She has to support her president. Well, you know, uh, me thinks uh, that President Brown doth protest too much about the pilots. I think she knows what she agreed to. Yeah. And, um, yeah, she knows what she agreed to, but, but and, and, and this is why I say I, I apologize for what I've said in the past. What do you I mean? Said, well, when I said I didn't understand why Yorick and Hero were horrible, now I mm -hmm. understand. Oh, <laughs> wait, what did President Brown do that makes you understand? I'm a bit confused. Well, you can't send someone to death and then wash your hands of it and, oh, I don't I didn't know what I was doing. Listeners, okay. this I'm is why... Being slightly, slightly facetious. The listeners, Bubba. this is why you have to subscribe. Because when you hear mm -hmm. this and you're like, I got to unsubscribe from this silliness. This is so ridiculous. President Brown, I am still a fan. But I do would appreciate what this show did. In most shows, I think they would... And I'm being serious about this. In most shows, they would show, okay, this person kind of rises to the challenge already. Mm -hmm. But President Brown is having real serious struggles and is some making making some 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 honest mistakes here and mm. so she's not like a superhero who is like ready to be president like she's doing her best and she's struggling to except for the usurping part she's doing great at that catfish let me tell you about another character who is doing great mm -hmm. in, in this tough position 
and yet rising to meet the challenge. Tell me who. Senate, Secretary Regina Oliver. She has Listen. got this ugly wound, but she is still willing to shake the hand of the woman who she's going to claim the presidency from. I love it. I love it. This She has all the confidence of a woman who hasn't dyed her own hair since seventh grade. <laughs> Do you dye your own hair, you proletariat surf? Come on. No, of course no, you have somebody else do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. Christine, who mm -hmm. got a seat at the table but maybe sees, mm -hmm. a, sees a better seat under a Regina Oliver administration, goes to see the new president. But guess what? My girl Regina has the receipts of Christine dissing her on The View. Snap oh, back. Oh, hell yes. You know, the, you know, the great thing is, mm -hmm. is that Christine did this. Right. And that actually... Christine might have less of a seat at the table under Regina Oliver than under President Brown. Because since since she's politically aligned with Regina, Regina doesn't have to say, well, I need to make room for her because she has differing opinion. No. Regina slapped Christine and down. Hell yes. Oh, hell, hell yes. yes. Secretary Oliver is telling straight up facts. Your father won in a landslide and still the socialists are in charge. Hello. Snap. Oh, oh man. man. Some really some you know but, but you know yeah. we love we love snappy dialogue and we haven't yeah. really I mean there's been some good lines but this episode really trafficked in some snappy dialogue. Okay, well now Christine is once again trying to weasel her way in. She is determined. I love it. She says you have friends here. She's trying to get back on Secretary Oliver's good side. Love it. Uh -huh. Secretary Oliver is acting like she don't need any friends. You know why? Why? Because she's not having any doubts about the power she should wield. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now temporary President Brown comes in and um, is, you know, they're having their little tete a tete. And President Brown is like, no, 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 this isn't about me. This is all hands on deck. And Secretary Oliver snaps back, as long as you're in charge. Booyah. Oh, man. She, you know, Bubba, I didn't yeah. realize it until this episode. Let's hear it. But this, this, I don't know whether the show needed it, but I think it's more enjoyable with an identifiable villain. But villain. You know what I mean? We didn't really have an identifiable villain the first two episodes. And now we realize... President Brown is a villain oh, because she's stopping terrible. Regina Oliver from taking her rightful place at the head of the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, so listeners, we are having a bit of fun with this creepy AF character, Regina Oliver. Do you like this new president showing up? Are you ready for four more years of President Brown? Let us know on social media at double PHQ. The word double, the single letter P for podcasts. HQ for headquarters at Double PHQ. I think this is going to be thrilling. I think so good. I think you know, yes, the the politics and the demeanor of Secretary Regina Oliver would make for a terrible president, but possibly a wonderfully delicious drama. So <laughs> this is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, well now, Catfish, since we've covered up the wonderful capital city of D.C., are you ready to go up to Boston? Hey, are you going to park the car? Hey, in gotta, Harvard, Harvard without, yeah. any, with, without any TVs. All right, so uh, we, we started Boston. We got uh, military vehicles rolling mm -hmm. through the street. Yeah. We see posters of President Brown with the word liar across her forehead. Yep. People have really bought into um, uh, that there is some sort of mystery. I don't know why people would assume that it's their government that's after them when it happened around the world. Yeah. I mean, would they have to assume that, like, that the United States is lying about everything else? Oh, it, it, seems, it seems strange. You know, the other reason it kind of seems strange is, what? I mean, we all know that as far as, like, kind of left wing, right wing, that women tend to be more uh, left left leaning. I mean, it's women who have saved this country by voting in a certain way. And so to see to see this kind of large, angry uprising spearheaded by women is 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 uh, uh, shocking. You know, I mean, and I assume in some ways, you know, when it's you know take down the patriarchy, whatever. You know, I mean, I'd be curious to see if all the men were gone. Would this really happen, or would this just be a better world? <laughs> 
Well, catfish. I think people mm-hmm. love debating this, but I believe the showrunners on Twitter have kind mm-hmm. of pointed out that this is not a man versus woman thing. There are extreme views across gender. And so there are, there are, but but I would love to see a country ruled by we have I mean, I can't remember the the last country that was ruled by a matriarchy rather than a patriarchy. Okay. You know, so I mean Hold on. Maybe hold on. I'm being reverse sexist by assuming that assuming, totally. it would be a better world if there were just women in it. Have but, you seen? Hold on. We are in the COVID nineteen mm-hmm. pandemic, listeners, yeah, as we record this. I, and have you that. seen the hellscape that is New Zealand? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Believe me, believe me, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> if someone, let, I'll just beg my listeners: if somebody can get me to New Zealand mm-hmm. uh, and give me a New Zealand passport. I'm all in. Oh, I will man. go to New Zealand at the drop of a hat. Well, I'm okay. all for New Zealand. Now, Catfish, all right, so now Catfish look, hold on, hold on, hold on. Have yeah. you been mm-hmm. to Boston? I have been to Boston, yes. Because seeing these military vehicles, seeing the, the, mm-hmm. the statue there at Fenway Park, to me, it reminded me of my tourist trip on the Freedom Trail. You know, it looked the same. So it's like hasn't changed after the event. You know what else hasn't changed? What? Yorick has an inferiority complex, oh, no. even though he's the last man in the world. He's making fun of Dr. Mann, putting her down. He refuses to shave. Yeah. I mean, at this point, like, does someone need to tell him? Just shave, bro. Shave. At least that way, from far away, someone might mistake you for a woman. From far away, he wouldn't be in so much trouble. Shave, bro. Shave. That ad brought to you by Boston Company Gillette. (laughs) (laughs) And so Agent 355 is doing kind of what we debated last week about what last week she brought York into the market. This week is like, York, stay here. I'm going to take care of this. She goes up to the checkpoint and she's mentioning she was part of some airborne division and she Mm -hmm. gets in. This is hashtag terrible security by the people there at Harvard Yard. But it shows once again, she's incredibly competent. She is a badass. Sorry, court at Jadeev. We keep seeing this part of her. I love it. Now, the armed forces are fighting against the populace, and they're fighting back with tear gas. Youch! And it seems the populace attacked or raided, I should say, most likely, a science lab on campus first. What do you think, what do you think about this state that Boston's in? You were just talking about what it really happened, but here the show is presenting us as these desperate people need food, They think the government isn't telling them something. Little do they know what the government isn't telling them. But to me, it's presented a bit as if these protesters are the good guys. Well, it is a little bit. I mean, we see Yorick, who uh, once again (laughs) basically delivers 355's speech for her and then ignores the speech that he gave as her. So we do get to see them. What's kind of interesting is, I mean, Bubba, do you think that they are protecting this under orders of the president so that to try to save Dr. Mann? Otherwise, this seems to be counter to what the president's saying. Protect the people. So don't fight the people to save buildings, antiquities, etc. It seems to me you'd be better off if you just did not fight the people unless they were attacking you. So what do you think about that? I think, well, I think you're absolutely right. We have heard the president say that buildings aren't important, art isn't important, and yet here we hear the exact reverse section. I think obviously the chain of command and getting these messages out are difficult here. Agent 355, competent in every way, but naturally, you, you know, damages the satellite phone. So who's to say if these people aren't acting on orders they assume they would receive? The thing is, you would think that one of the hardest things that it would be for military to do would be to attack their own citizens Mm -hmm. or even, you know, defend, kill American citizens unless there's a real good reason for it. And it seems to me that art and buildings are not a good enough reason for that. Uh, whoever Whoever is giving that order is doing horrible things. They're essentially sentencing other Americans to death for not the good reason, I think. Okay. All right. Well, this was this is an interesting debate I think we are having. I think, you know, how are you going to feed yourself with art painting? So I guess that's a good point. 
let's go to this part though. The mm-hmm. these people, these these fighters, protesters, I'm calling them protesters, but they're really just trying to get essential supplies, I would assume. They are the people who are dissing Yorick's mom. They're the people, this seems to be a printing press, which is printing out these posters with the with the word liar across his mom's forehead. They're also making bombs. We saw a bomb being made in there. And yet, once again, they're very kind to York. They treat York very kind when they find him and assume he's a trans person. York, they kind of force him to finally get up and start helping. And he milk, it does a body good against tear gas, apparently. And I love this line that one of these uh, fighters, how about that as a description form, said, she said, the waiting is the worst part, worse than 2013 manhunt after the marathon. Now, ooh, now that is a real world, world incident that even now, what is it, eight years later, I think many of us remember. And uh, I love that moment. I thought, you know, why did I go up to eight from seven? It's moments like this that I think are really strong. Yeah, it's good. I am not sure exactly. I mean, uh, maybe they had us meet that person so that we could have this discussion and think about this ill-advised thing that is happening I mean, if they were protecting food supplies, if they were protecting other people, that would be one thing, but yeah. 355, crabs, Yorick, they've got to go. She kind of ignores the whole, like, he's like, I lost the knife. How did you lose it if you were just sitting here the whole time? We go right over that. She's dealt with Yorick enough. It's not even worth talking to. So they go to Dr. Mann's apartment. And we see that it appears from the evidence. Mm-hmm. I'm not a police detective, but I would assume from this evidence, she hasn't been there a while. There's old, hard-dried coffee in a bar. There mug. is. But Bubba, let yep. me tell you something. We hadn't even met Dr. Mann yet, and I knew she was going to be one of, if not my favorite character. She's got a, there's a plaque there that's got uh, names of winners of all the STEM award. She's won it a few times. For all the other people who have won it, yeah. except for her and Helga Tereshko, she has ri- written things down on post-it notes and taped it over their names. Things like dumbass, idiot, creep, moron, and ignoramus. Yeah. I love Dr. Mann. Already, haven't even met her yet. Love her. Well, guess what? I love her, too. And you know why I love her? Tell me. She's reading one of my favorite novels, The Goldfinch by Donna oh, Tartt. Oh, and movies. You love that movie. Oh, that movie, boy. You want to talk about... Here, we're watching a great adaptation of Why the Last Man comic series. You want to see an adaptation that didn't quite live up to the greatness. Uh, the Goldfish uh-huh. was... The Goldfinch was... What is the kindest way I can say terrible? Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Ter- say horrible. Oh, people okay. people was, never react to that. People never right. react to that. Heroable. Perfect. There's a crib in this apartment that seems to be a slight mystery tied to it. Any idea mm-hmm. why there's a crib in Dr. Mann's apartment? Any speculation? Any guess? I could speculate just based on my knowledge of this character from the comics. Oh, be All careful, I'll say is... No, I'm going to do that. All I'm going to say is... She did mention that some of the stuff that she did wasn't legal, and she did use the C word. C word. Clone. Clone. Oh, yeah. So I just take that, take that what you will. She said it. It wasn't hidden. She said it. Okay. Now, Yorick, Detective Yorick, is on the case. He sees photos of a thing, I believe it's called the Boston Club. Was it that? Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. We're in Boston. Right. I'm sure that's the only place in Boston known as Boston Club. They go there from the from the look of the place they're going to. It feels like it was like the old boys club, some room filled with cigar smoking men. And I, you know, I always mention when this show doesn't have a lot of music in it, it has 355 in York are searching this place. There's this rhythmic pulse kind of uh, soundtrack that I thought is great as ratcheting up the tension. Alas, I'm a bit like York. He was cocky as hell. He said, hey, I bet she's here. She was there. Even though just a second ago he couldn't pick the lock and get in, when he's proven right, he's a cocky man. Way to go, York. Way to represent all us cocky SOBs. And way to go, Dr. Ben, hmm? doing the second thing to confirm how much I love her. She attacks York. Oh, now wait a minute. And then she also trashes him by saying, wait, is the monkey male too? Because if it was just you, you don't mean shit. But if it's you and the monkey... That means something. So once again, she basically told Yorick a monkey was worth more than him. Dr. Mann, 
I'm going to give you my own plaque. Hashtag hero. Well, what do you think will happen when Dr. Man meets hero? Do you think <laughs> she's like, I tried to kill one of these brown kids. Now's my real chance. Uh, no, no. She is going to TCB take care of business. But Dr. Man doesn't like President Brown. That's not cool. And she doesn't care what President Brown wants. She wants to go to San Fran. What I the mean, heck? if she doesn't care what President Brown wants, I think she'd really be in trouble with the real president. Because as you said, it's illegal cloning. That kind of uh, raises the hackle of the, uh, the right-wing crowd. Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, also, some people on the left, which is why illegal. Why do you think they forgive her so much? And don't, they don't even, like, restrain her. Agent 355, as we've said numerous times, is a badass. If she wanted to, she could have subdued Dr. Mann and dragged her back to D.C. Why not? Why, why doesn't she pay any consequence for stabbing Yorick? You mean uh, other than getting uh, another trophy? No, bro. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Okay. I, I mean, listen... I mean, San Francisco may be far, but 355 is not taking Yorick back to wa to Washington. So if it has to be San Francisco, it has to be San Francisco. And also... I can't believe you just said San Francisco is not that far. They're in Boston, man. What's no, no, no. I mean, it, yeah, it's, I, if I said that, I misspoke. They have to stay away from Washington, D.C. And also, who knows? We're about to come across more mystery with 355. I'm not sure what her real deal is. I've already mm -hmm. compared this show to Game of Thrones once. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point in the episode, I am getting big Game of Thrones flashback in that Yorick, okay. you know, it is a very tense situation, so Yorick is trying to break the ice with what he calls the tuna fish sandwich joke. This is raising my red alarm. My alarms are going off in my head for Game of Thrones' infamous Tyrion's jackass and honeycomb in a brothel joke. In Game of Thrones, they referenced it three times throughout eight seasons. This, uh, I brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel joke. We never once hear the punchline. We didn't hear the punchline to this joke. There was a famous thing in Game of Thrones where the showrunners, like, put up a thing on the wall where they offered people in the crew to come up with the best punchline to, hey, I brought a jackass and honeycomb into a brothel. Like, are we ever going to hear the tuna fish sandwich joke? Yes or no? They're going to hold out, and if we get to season seven, it'll be the very last joke in the entire show. Okay, so I decided to Google tuna sandwich, tuna fish sandwich jokes, and believe it or not, there is a page, upjoke.com slash tuna dash jokes. Are you ready for some of the jokes that Yorick could have told here. Uh, oh boy, all right, yes, I'm ready. A uh, tuna fish sandwich walks into a bar. Mm -hmm. Bartender says, sorry, we don't serve food here. Mmm, that's a good one. Okay, what's better than a tuna sandwich? What? A threena sandwich. Mmm, mmm. Do you think she would have stabbed Yorick if he had said any of these? I mean, I could only have hoped. The last one I'll steal from this website Mm -hmm. How do you tuna fish? How? You raise or lower the scales. Mm. Hello. Mm. I'll be here all week because you can download this podcast on any platform. <laughs> Ouch. You can't unsubscribe in frustration and irritation. So uh, do you think we'll no. hear any of those groaners going uh, forward? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean... Uh, as impressive as his joke telling is that he is also a teacher, a teacher of magic. Now, the 355, I, you have to help me out here, Bubba. Okay. Is 355 goes to use a sat phone. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to offer you three options. Let's hear it. Number one, is she only now discovering that it's broke because Yorick had it and he broke it? Is it not really broke and she's just using that as an excuse to go meet her, her friend uh, also numbered? Or is there a third option and I'm wrong about the first two? What I would assume is that somehow it broke. She has been in fights. She has been, uh, you know, an action hero. She somehow crash landed the helicopter. Did she not notice the sat phone was breaking till now? Broke until now? That doesn't seem very likely. Doesn't seem like her. Yeah, That's I, why I, I thought it was one of the other two options. 
Well, Agent 355, she, mm-hmm. she, says, she says to Yorick, hey, charm the doc, I got to go and fix this sat phone. And she goes to the address on the note. So it was back in episode two there where she went to box 355, got into the secret room. Then she pulled out, you know, what seemed like personal belongings, the necklace that she always feels like she's reaching and touching. And there was this card that said, not yet. And it had an address. And she goes to that address. It's all boarded up. She breaks in. She hears floorboards creaking. Somebody's here. Rut row. She draws her gun, but this person gets the drop on her. And we have a kick-ass Black Widow fight. Hell Holy cow. Yeah. What do you think? This was great. This was this action is good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This was a this was some badass action. I mean, here's the thing. They set up this other person very well because we know how much of a badass 355 is. And so they pretty much fight to a standstill so we know the other person also a badass. Now. Mm-hmm. Now a bunch of stuff happens that I'm very confused about. Bubba. Yeah, it did. It was fast and furious once Agent 355 and Agent 525 right. stop their fighting so, and get down to Culper Ring business. So 525 kind of makes an assumption that their names are both numbers because she says I'm 525 instead of saying who the F are you? Did they just, she assumed that because they're both badasses, that they're both in the same That's place. what I thought. That's what I thought. She says she's waiting for her. Yep. And then she says, did Fran give you this address? And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second. Some people have names. How did Fran rate a name? And then she says, you're 1030. That's 355 says, is your 1030 alive? Does that mean they're in two different ones? Why did she refer to as your 1030? Is that some sort I of code like ten four? Yeah, on. is is ten thirty some sort of code like ten four? Is a breaker breaker oh, good maybe, buddy? Or? Maybe maybe your ten thirty is like ten thirty is in charge. Ten thirty is the one who's in charge of giving assignments. Or your that's your that, that's that's the person who's above you. So maybe that's what it means. Anyway, it felt a little nebulous i don't want them to confuse me more on this issue i want them to make things a little bit clearer on this issue you know we get a little bit more learning about the background you know 525 is like where do they get you from since you're clearly broken and being manipulated you either came from foster care or juvenile detention you know, it's that standard thing. They find somebody, people without families who were broken and it could also sort of indicate that they could uh, give people medals, let's say, without having any personal feelings or agita about it. I'm using agita twice now in the same podcast. You express some frustration over the first couple of podcasts where we mm-hmm. mentioned that Agent 355 mm-hmm. was placed next to the president because of a credible threat. And then on the day that she gets in front of the president, with the president, in the room with the president, all these men die. Now we find out that Agent 525, where was she put? Uh, The State Department? I forget where she was put. But sure enough, she's put somewhere. And guess what? The day she gets there on that assignment, all these men die. Does Fran know something about what happened? What was the credible threat? How frustrated are you or are you intrigued? What do you think? Well, I mean, you know, I think I said this on the previous podcast or or the one before that is like they are really going all in on the mystery of 355 and what's going on. So I assume that they are really going to make this bear fruit. Otherwise, they wouldn't have spent so much time on it so early in this. Uh, Although it doesn't seem, you know, I mean, they could assume that you but I, I this seems more like a credible, you know, Someone wouldn't say there was a credible threat to the president if the threat was going to be all men are are killed. I, I feel like. I feel like that's a little nonspecific. I mean, that's more like, hmm, there's been a credible threat to humanity. Yeah. No, there sure has. Now, this Agent 525, whoever this character Fran is, Agent 525 isn't having it. There's no tracker. She's like, I'm going to find Fran, and I'm going to put a bullet in him, where... Agent 355 does carry a tracker. That was kind of like the cliffhanger, like she wants to be found by this friend. What do you think's going on here? Any speculation? Because I don't think this is in the comic series. Bubba, it is not, and I'm not sure. All I know is Fran better watch her step because someone is jealous because they have a number and you have a name. 
Listeners, what do you speculate will happen with Fran and the Culper Ring and all the mysterious, credible threats we've heard about so far? At Double PHQ, Twitter and Instagram, we want to hear from you. Now, hey, there's also some mystery. We mentioned the crib, but with Dr. Mann. She has some sort Mm -hmm. of scars on her belly. Is that correct? She really must have been a fan of that Netflix show where she draws penises on things because she drew, drew a couple dicks on photos in the club. She is a hater. Hashtag hater. Mm, I love it. I love it. And she also hates, hates teaching, too. She only does it so she can pay the bills. And guess what else she really isn't fond of? Men over What's 40. Because their genetic material, it sucks. You know what she's not good at, though, Bubba, is determining people's ages. <laughs> because Yorick is way less than 40 years old. He's lived a hard life. And this is where man and Yorick get drunk on, was it Chardonnay, I think she said? We're not drinking uh, the Chardonnay. Then she lets him know that, uh, talks about uh, the uh, genetic material that both, uh, the babies have, both male and female, Mm -hmm. um, and that millions of women drop dead because they also had a Y chromosome. Yeah, I Um, I love Dr. Mann and her sassiness. She's so good. And she hits hard because she says, even if we figure out why you survived Yorick, why ampersand, the monkey survived. Earth is still effed. The biodiversity is effed. This is terrible. And then... Yeah, we gotta... We gotta... I mean, think about it. So for men... Yeah. Right? I mean, humans have a long life. So if we can... If we can figure out how to reproduce humans using... uh, you, You know, we still... There are some animals that don't live very long so we got to get cracking on those if all the men have died for all the animals that don't reproduce asexually we need to get on that or our biodiversity it gone now dr man does have some sympathy in her she looks at yorick and says i don't envy you you won't have much of a life from now on oh that's all we need now that's the one mistake that dr man makes is it's feeding into yorick's persecution complex I liked that she said it. I'm on Team York. I like all these characters. This, you know, we try not to give out spoilers in the comics, but this is the main team, in my opinion. These three, Dr. Man, Agent 355, York. This is our crew, and we're apparently going to go across the country whether we've talked to the president and got her okay or not. I love it. The only thing I hope is it feels like 355 has softened and the criticism that she's given Yorick, and that's no why man. we need Dr. Mann to come in no and man. slap him down besides physically attacking him. So I hope she doesn't soften up too much either. Yorick needs to get verbally uh, slapped upside the head to get him out of his, uh, his uh, selfish funk, like on a regular basis, like every half hour. No, oh, man. Such a hater. He, he's a lot like Dr. Man. No wonder he likes Dr. Man so much. Hater. I love Dr. Man. Okay. Hey, listeners, we've broken down this episode, but before we wrap up this podcast, we've got to get to that wonderful musical segment from Double M, Matt Murdock, but also we have to give out our weekly awards. Catfish, yes. what's our first award this week? Oh, man, our first award is the Whoa Man of the episode uh, because we have got so many powerful, awesome... Uh, women, every week we are going to give an award to our whoa man of the episode. I have given it four straight times to Agent 355, and I am so, so thrilled to be able to give this award to somebody new. It's not that Agent 355 didn't represent tonight. It's that our new character, Dr. Man, brought it heart, trashing people via post-it, doing what I've wanted someone to do to York for five episodes, which is clock him hard. Plus, mm-hmm. she has my favorite exchange of the episode. Let's when York says, did you draw all these dicks? And Dr. Mann said, people grieve in their own way. Hell yes. Let's give it up for Dr. Mann. My, your, everybody's whoa man of the episode. Well, Catfish, I completely think you're wrong, but I'm mm-hmm. going to agree. Excellent. <laughs> and so my woe man of this episode is also Dr. Man, but for a different reason than you. Okay, for the wrong reasons. Let's hear it. Dr. Man wins the weekly award for me because, like me, she'll never say she's sorry. <laughs> I love Ten it. Ten times, I I'll never it. say it. I love it. 
All right, well, uh, and our next award to give is our Yorick, I knew him sorta, award. Ways in which we are either like or not like Yorick mm-hmm. from his actions in this episode. Oh, well, let and me Bubba, go first. Go for it. Alas, Yorick, I knew him sorta, in that I'm like Yorick in this way. When I'm talking to a woman and this woman is drunk, I just shut up and let her go. <laughs> just, you know, say anything you want to say. I will not interrupt. Very good. Very smart. Very smart. It's one of the few smart things Yorick has done in five episodes. <laughs> and Bubba, yeah. so finally he's acting like you. Unfortunately, he also acted like me in this episode. Like Yorick, I sometimes make the same mistake twice. No, oh, no. <laughs> and in this episode, it's the second time he has walked away when he knew not to. And he's lucky he didn't get took again because 355 wasn't there to save him. Mm. So much, so much. Now, Catfish, are you mm-hmm. ready for everybody's favorite segment that doesn't feature you or I? Uh, b- 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 I you mean the only segment that doesn't feature you or I? And it's the, the your favorite, do. It's the M- Double M Matt Murdock's musical analysis, looking at the music of episode five. Well, let's hear it. So, two pieces of music that we've already kind of talked about before appeared yet again in this episode five. Sometimes what the themes are being used for seems to change with each episode. So what I thought I would do this time is just talk about how these pieces of music tend to make us feel as opposed to what they're being used for. The first piece of music is this. We heard this when 355 was approaching the checkpoint and introducing herself to the guards there at Harvard. So this now makes two instances where we've heard it with Agent 355 for certain, one being when she first went back to her checkpoint and was looking through her box of stuff, and this time around here at Harvard. Because it is just a simple melody over sometimes differing beds underneath, which may be changing the context of it, but doesn't really harmonically change anything about how we feel about it. Because of that, I just want to concentrate on the fact that this is a minor melody. What do we know about minor? It tends to be more serious, darker, less aspects of hope or happiness within it. A long time ago, there was this guy named Pythagoras, and you may know a lot about what he did with triangles from school, but he actually tried to apply mathematics to just about every aspect of life, and he was kind of the father of what composers call psychoacoustics. And one of the rules of psychoacoustics is that the distances between notes when they're played at the same time make us feel a certain way emotionally, and that has been reinforced through the creation of most Western music that we're familiar with from the medieval period onward, especially as we got into the Baroque period, say like a Bach or the classical periods with Mozart and Beethoven or the Romantic period with a Tchaikovsky. These rules have been very much established to where they seem the norm to us now in Western music But what you must remember is that sometimes there is just a basic instinctual element to certain sounds and we react to them emotionally in that way, whether we're conditioned to by hearing other pieces of music or not. And in this case, there's a darkness to this. What does that mean for Agent 355? Well, we found out throughout the course of this episode that there's a lot more going on with her than just fulfilling this mission for the president. The other theme that we can talk about that's recurring is this one. Now this theme, conceptually, we relate to the event. Character-wise, 
We'd been relating it mostly to Hero and Nora because that's when we had heard it most. And either way is fine, but this time around it falls under the more conceptual thing of thinking about what happened on that day of the event. It occurs as Dr. Mann is telling Yorick about how much they lost. Giraffes, monkeys, dogs. That's a reflection on the day. So conceptually, that rings true with the way that it was first used during the actual event. But why should that evoke that kind of feeling? Why is it when people are talking about things that are sad, losing so much on that day, does it work that way? Well, it also is in minor, which can bring sadness, but it has this flow of tension and really a lack of of real resolution to it that helps perpetuate that feeling. One of the other things that Pythagoras taught us about music is that we humans like to get tensed, but we also need release from that tension as we listen to certain notes going together. The first chord is minor. The second chord adds a note that creates a great deal of tension because it doesn't really fit with that chord and yet plays at the same time as that chord. It is the major seventh against the minor chord. You don't need to know those terms, but that's what creates the tension, this chord. The next chord actually has the most resolution of all of the chords, but it still has what we call the fifth in the top note. And what the fifth does is it represents what we call the dominant. The dominant always needs to resolve to the one, back to the place where it feels like the key is centered. So listen to the top note and the way it fits against the bottom note, and you can feel that there's still tension. It still needs to go somewhere else. Even though it is a technically a major chord and should make us feel happier, it doesn't because of that tension. And then the final chord sets up returning back to the minor one, but it never gets there. It just hangs there. It is a version of the dominant chord that needs to resolve back to tonic. It needs to resolve back to what we feel like is the home key, but it never does. And that's what gives us the overwhelming sadness and tension, just as we keep experiencing these people who recollect the day of the event and they don't have the answers either. And there's a frustration in that. The tension is never released for them. And so musically, the tension is never released for us. And that's all I've got for this week. Back to Bubba and Catfish. Oh, Matt is always so smart and he does very little silliness like we do. He does a little bit, which is charming, but he's not a complete silly fool like you and I are. You know, Catfish, I was listening to our good podcasting friends, TV Podcast Industries, who do their own Why the Last Man After Show podcast. How dare they? Uh, no, they're great. They're <laughs> our friends. Sometimes we do the same shows, sometimes we don't. But uh, they were mentioning Matt, and they gave our podcast a shout-out. And those guys are from across the pond, as they say. And I loved when they mentioned our podcast. They called it Zed the podcast you listen to after you've watched Why the Last Man. And don't you love rather than Z? Over there, it's Zed. I love it, I love it, I love it. Thank they're you so guys for the shout-out. They're so goddamn sophisticated. I know, they are. Now, Catfish, one thing that this show mm -hmm. has yet to answer in the first five right. episodes of season one is why did mm -hmm. this happen? Why did all the creatures, mammals with Y chromosomes, drop dead? What is it? Each week, we've got to figure out what clues the mm -hmm. show is giving us and pick our suspect of the week. Catfish, mm. what caused this? Uh, the showrunner's personal assistant, the Eliza Clark's personal assistant, said that uh, we are funny and they love listening to us, so clearly they always tell the truth. So they said it was the rabbits, and I believe her. Oh, man. Man, is it that simple? 
all that lab testing we did on rabbits, and they got their revenge this way. Ouch. Brutal. Well, that's going to be a real shock uh, when Ampersand <laughs> ends up uh, killing Yorick <laughs> when they're right on the cusp of the discovery about how to change all this. That l- glass knife in the back. I love it. Now, Son can, of a gun! I know. Say, so, so, all right. So that's that was that's my answer. But yeah. you, you know, you have to have a different one. Have to. So, uh, what is what is who is your suspect of the week? Now, Catfish. This is a show they spend a lot of money on. Okay. And there are visual clues mm-hmm. in the oh, episode okay. as to what caused mm-hmm. it. And so, okay, we're looking at all these visual clues. There was one specific image that they focused on for quite a while that Uh-oh. I think they wanted us to take a note, you know, do screen grabs and zoom in and see if we could mm-hmm. C- mm-hmm. see what the cause of this deadly virus was. And uh-huh. uh, I did a screen grab, had to open up Photoshop and get out the zoom tool and go in and then use the hand tool to move around, then the selector tool, and then I did control T to transform it, and I saw what the sh- what was in the shot. What was it, Bubba? What was it? It was a statue of the thing that caused the mass extinction event. And what caused it? The Boston Red Sox. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a statue of the Boston Red Sox? No, it was the actual baseball team, the Boston Red Sox, which caused oh, this okay. mass extinction event. They think about this timing, Catfish. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of years, mm-hmm. they wanted to win the pennant and never mm-hmm. could. And so they win the pennant. Finally, it ruins that Jimmy Fallon movie, which, you know, with Drew Barrymore. They're like, hey, that's a shame. They, the the we, one that was based on a soccer movie. Right. Yeah, uh-huh. A soccer book. Right. It was a book. Anyway. So, sure, yeah, sure. The Boston Nick Red Hornsby, Sox sure. finally win the pennant and they win mm-hmm. the World Series. And they're like, mm-hmm. boy, it took us 100 years to win this. And then they realized, oh, no, we haven't won it again. We'll never win it again. We're going out on top. And they killed everybody. Now, admittedly, maybe they don't care if if a league of their own win the pennant, but it's those evil, violent Mm. Boston Red Sox who win, who did this to us. That's why they shot that shot of the the statue of all of those guilty people. And so Mm. now that we've solved it, you know what? I think it's time to quit watching baseball. (laughs) Are you sure that it wasn't Bill Belichick that, like, the NFL was about to catch him cheating again? And he's just like, let's just end everything. You'll never catch me alive. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, So good. We love it. Listeners, do you have an idea after five episodes of what caused this mass extinction event? Write to us. We're begging you to write to us. Mainly because... We are... are, uh, We're like York. We've got a uh, a miserable life ahead of us. (laughs) (laughs) So, hey, for everybody here at Double P Podcast, Double P Media, my name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M, at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Catfish. You can hit me up at CJG Man 67, your 67th favorite CJG Man. And you will hear us next time on Zed, the podcast you listen to after you've watched Yastremski. The last man. <laughs> we'll be back next week, everybody. Breaking down episode six. Weird, Isn't it Weird Al is dead? Weird Al, That's Al is so sad. Weird Al is dead. Agent <laughs> oh, no. Yorick, Agent 355, and Dr. Mann hit a snag on their way to San Fran. As the search for 355 heats up, though, Jennifer clashes with former cabinet secretary Regina Oliver, who has her eyes and other body parts on the presidency. Mm. This is the first time I'm sad we've lost all the men. Why Weird Al? Yeah, that is not right. <laughs>